Wow. Well, uh, the pleasure and the joy is mine. Could we pause not only here, but I know on all the 14 or 15 campuses, you know, these people practice and pray and use their gifts. I don't know about you, it is a privilege. That last song, was that amazing? I mean, just thank you, worship team. Thank you for all the tech people. Thank you for all the people behind the scenes. I don't know how it works, but I just know. Boy, when we got to the end and I heard all your voices, it was like, I just had this sense. God is looking down from heaven and he's pleased. He's really pleased. He loves for us to share how much we love him, but when we recognize who he is. Well, we're gonna be in Romans 12, verses nine through 13, and I wanna start with a, a story, a true story. I'm gonna call this person Andy, because his name's Andy. And uh, it was a time I was pastoring California, and the church was going through explosive growth at the time. It was very exciting, but you're always short on leaders, and every now and then, someone would move in from another town, and they happened to be a leader and a godly man, and you know, we became friends pretty quickly. And within you know, a year or so, boy, Andy was just a great guy, godly family, teaching a class, great reputation in the community, just you know, one of those guys as a pastor that was, boy, so grateful. He's loving and helping people. And so I get a call and Andy says, hey, I, I really need to talk with you. And uh, I, I've been going out of town for the last, actually, several months on Tuesday. And I've told my wife, it's a business meeting, but it's not. And I thought, oh boy, I'm wondering when this is going. He said, uh, when I was seven years old, uh, there were some magazines under my dad's bed. Uh, when I was in pre-teens, I got introduced to um, harder pornography. Uh, I have craved, I pride, I've done everything I can do. I'm in God's word every day. I've memorized scriptures. I've, I've had this secret for over three decades. I've served as a, as a deacon, as an elder. I've taught classes. I love my children. I've worked on my marriage. And I've had this secret. And on these Tuesdays, I heard about a group of men with my problem. And they meet, and they're honest with one another. And I shared things with them that I've never shared with anyone else. And I found out I wasn't alone. And it was during that time something radical happened. And don't get me wrong, I've been clean for six months or maybe nine months, but it just, I keep falling back into it until now. Uh, I came back and I realized I've gotta come completely clean, talk to my wife, I might lose my marriage. I was scared to death, but we've been through all that and we're in good shape. This is really bold. Chip, could I speak to our church? I said, what? He said, my wife will be on the front row. I have to tell my story, because you just don't have any idea how many are struggling, either with this or other things. And I experienced something that broke the power of that in my life. And it's what everyone needs. And I tried everything. And the question I wanna ask all of us here is why is it that so many really good, sincere Christians get stuck? I mean, I'm talking about people that want to grow, want to do what God wants them to do. You actually read the Bible. You come to church regularly. You, many of you are already serving, but you have a habit. You still are codependent. You're still pleasing people. That still, no matter what, you have this explosive angers. You still have issues in your marriage that you've been working on, or you have these outrageous times with, oh, I don't want to be that father. I don't want to be that person. And, and you just, or it's a secret an addiction, and it's covered up pretty well, but it eats you up inside. Why are so many Christians who are sincere, who are trying hard, who really want to do the right thing, why have you spiritually plateaued? Why are you stuck? And what I want you to know is here's the axiom. The greatest seed in the greatest soil cannot grow in the wrong environment. 
Let me say that again. The greatest seed, and I'm, I'm speaking spiritually here. Remember the parable of the seed and the sowers? Luke 8, Matthew 13. The Son of Man sows the seed of the Word of God. God's Word always produces fruit 100% of the time in the right soil. And he says there's four kinds of soils. There's the hard-hearted soil. There's the shallow-hearted soil. There's the thorny soil where the riches and deceitfulness and desire of other things choke out God's word. And then there's the good soil. The man, the woman would say good, this text says a noble or honest heart who puts God's word into practice and with perseverance produces fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. But I'm going to suggest that good seed and a sincere and good heart doesn't always produce fruit or life change in the wrong environment. Here's a picture that will give you an idea. Uh, that's a very beautiful house plant, good seed. Uh, that soil is wonderful. If my wife were here, she puts miracle Grow in hers and it makes it really go well. But if you took that house plant and put it in that desert, how long do you think it would, how long? A day? Maybe a few hours. Some of you, are you ready? Some of you are that house plant. You have an honest, good heart. You want to grow. You receive good seed. You even come to church. You're even in the Bible. And you're stuck. And many of you, you're stuck in an area that no one else knows about. This morning, can I tell you something? You are going to have the opportunity to discover a special environment that will allow you to get unstuck. See, certain plants only grow in the desert, some only in a rainforest, some in mild climates. But Christians grow in a very, very special ecosystem. So in our time together, let me tell you where we're going, what I'm gonna do, and how we're gonna get there. I'm gonna list five or six things that I'm gonna make the case for why the environment that I'm going to talk about, you have to have. Not nice, not for other people, you have to have it. And it will require many of you to rearrange your life and your priorities. But it'll work. After that, I'm gonna describe what this environment or ecosystem is spiritually that will allow you to grow beyond being stuck. And then after that, I'm gonna tell you exactly how to experience that environment. Are you ready? Number one. The command of Jesus requires a special spiritual environment. Jesus said in Matthew 13, after washing his disciples' feet, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. That command can't happen in a big group like this. He said it to 12 in a small room. The example of Jesus will argue for this supernatural environment where you can grow in ways that you couldn't. Matthew chapter, or Mark chapter three, 13 and 14, he prays all night, and after praying all night, he chose 12 that they might be with him. And he called them out, and he formed what we would probably call a small group, and they did life together. They walked together, they ate together, they shared together everything. The early church, they followed the same pattern, Acts 2, 42 to 47. The early church, what? They were committed to the apostles' teaching, right? And to the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayer. And God did awesome and miraculous things. And they came weekly, kind of to a big meeting like this at the temple and heard the apostles teach. And then they met from house to house where they had a meal, where they took off their mask, where they shared life. And in a very hostile community, they hung on for dear life to this new relationship with Jesus. And church history past and present, argues for this as well. There's been dips where, I mean, Christianity has really gotten off track. And so there was a monastic movement where people got together in smaller groups. Then there was the Moravians, and then there was the big thing that happened in Korea, a place where, I mean, there was at one point almost 1% were Christians. And then this revival happened that sent missionaries around the world. Or there's the Wesleyans. I mean, I could give you over and over and over. Do you realize that today, 70,000 people come to Christ every single day in the world? Don't listen to all that bad news. 70,000 people, but the great majority of it is not happening in traditional kind of churches. We work in India, Africa, Middle East, 
South America, and it's these, often in the Middle East, it's Muslim who find Christ, five or six people. They invite friends. The group multiplies. There, there's movements now, 10, 20, 120, I have a friend, they have 240,000 multiplying home groups that started in the Philippines. The, the gospel is spreading and people's lives are changing like never before, but there is a supernatural environment. There's an ecosystem. It's called authentic community. You can read the Bible, you can try hard, you can come to church, but if you are not in authentic community, there are certain things that will never change because part of God's plan to transform you and transform me happens in a connection with other people. Now, it demands a basket, if you will. So authentic community occurs how? In a small group. But I want you to be very careful. Being in a small group doesn't mean you have authentic community. There's a lot of small groups where you get together and maybe you discuss the sermon and if someone reads a passage or you share a little bit, but it's superficial. You, you, the real you doesn't show up. You, you put on your best face. It's a little deeper than with other people and you're nice to one another and pretty soon you're talking about sports and UK and the Cardinals and Louisville and you know, it's football season or what's on sale and, and it's nice and it's better than not being in a small group but it's, it's like you know, 60% social, 30% a little bit deeper spiritually but the real you isn't showing up saying, this is where I hurt. You don't have each other's back. You're not willing to do anything for one another to help each one of you become the man or the woman or the student God wants you to be. And so what I'm gonna suggest is that Romans chapter 12, verses nine through 13, will define for us what authentic community is and then how to get it. As you listen, I want you to just step back. I don't want you to hear or feel judgment or like I ought to be doing this or I ought to be doing that. I want you to think there's there's a place that God has designed that I could be loved and accepted just for who I am. There's a place where little by little, wisely, I could let down my guard and let people see who I really am, my strengths and my weaknesses and my struggles and my secrets. And the whole point would be that I would both receive that and give that and see God do things in me and through me that I just didn't believe could ever happen. That's the spirit in what I want you to hear this. Let's read the passage. In verse nine, he tells us the real you needs to show up. It says, let love be without hypocrisy. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. And then we're gonna learn in verse 10, you need to meet real needs, not just superficial ones. He says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love, giving preference to one another in honor. And then he says, as we get together and the real you meets real needs, make sure you do it for the right reason. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, notice, serving the Lord. And then finally, he's gonna say in verse 12 and 13, there's a way to do this out of God's resources, not just our own. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Now, if you would just open your Bible or your phone and you read those verses, there would be 13 commands or participles that have the force of a command that basically feels like do, 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 do. do. I mean, there's all kind of stuff, right? So context is after 11 chapters of this is all God's done for us, verse one, offer your bodies a living sacrifice. That happens at a point in time. You say, God, as Kyle shared, I'm all in. Second. You're on a journey of saying no to the world and yes to renewing your mind so that you could experience God's will. In our last time together, verses three through eight, we said, hey, we gotta come to grips with who we are. We shouldn't think too highly of ourselves or too low, but have an accurate self-assessment because we're formed in a body, just like our human bodies. We're a body, we're connected. So discover your gift and put it into play. Now he's gonna say, this is how it actually works. These are the attitudes and the actions. This is, this is how a small group becomes an authentic community that transforms our lives. The real you, not a projection of yourself. The issue here is authenticity 
impurity. It says, let love be without hypocrisy. Uh, in the uh, ancient world, when there was a drama, all the actors were male. So you would dress up as a man, dress up as a woman, you would learn to throw your voice, and great actors would play many different parts. So there would be a big stage, a Greek stage, and you might come out and have some you know, costume and have a sword and come up, la, 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 la. and then you go back and you change your clothes for the next scene, and then you're a woman and you would wear this mask as a man. Now you wear a mask as a woman and be in a just, la, 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 la. No. you get the idea of him. Some of you kind of enjoyed that. Some of you thinking, this dude is nuts, which is true. Here's what I want you to get. Paul took that word for mask, and he said, love has to be without a mask. Authentic community is take off your mask. Quit posing, quit projecting, quit acting like this or that, quit trying to look like this or that, quit trying to paint this picture, this visual hologram that this is who I am and I'm either cool or in or rich or poor or strong or we have all these versions of this is the kind of person that will get acceptance and for some of us, you get in different groups, you actually change your mask. He says, take it off. Because even if you get people to like the hologram, what you know, it's not really you. You don't receive any love. You hide behind it, I hide behind it. By the way, we all do this to some extent. He says love must be without hypocrisy. You gotta be authentic, you gotta show up and be the real you. Uh, part of what we're doing here with uh, Southeast is we created an inventory or an assessment, I guess they call it. And if you've ever taken strength finders, it, it'll test your, your strengths. Or maybe you have taken a test on spiritual gifts. We spent many years and hundreds of thousands of dollars and beta tested it multiple times in all kind of age groups. So we know it's 96% accurate. It will tell you, you take a test, it takes 20 to 30 minutes. A QR code will come up later. You'll learn, this is my personality. These are my passions. This is my spiritual gifts. Uh, this is my role on a team. And this is where I fit best in terms of God using my life. And then you'll get a printout that will give you your profile. And the whole point is simply for you to get some objective assessment. This is who you really are. And then you spend some time with other people. And then you realize, oh, wow, that's me. Then you know where you fit and you can bring the real you to bear. It's just a tool, it's just a beginning, but it's helpful. But one of the reasons why the real you doesn't show up is why Andy was posing all those years. He had a secret. I mean, I, th I thought I knew Andy. I didn't know Andy. At least I didn't know a whole part of him. And he was living with this, this projection of I'm a good husband, I'm a godly man, I teach the Bible, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an elder in the church, I'm a, I'm a pillar in the community, all the while dying inside with this cancer inside that no matter what he does, he can't overcome until he got with a group of other people with the same problem. And he sat down and he realized for the first time he wasn't alone. And for the first time, the real Andy showed up. Sin is so much like bacteria. It's an amazing thing. As long as it's in the dark, it just keeps growing. But you bring it into the light, light hits bacteria, phew, breaks it. And you think people have it together. No one in this room, no one on those campuses, no one at work, no one in your neighborhood, no one's got it together. We all have issues, we all have struggles. We all have insecurities. Are you ready for this? It takes so much energy to hide all that stuff and to pretend and project. You know what, why don't you take that energy, pull off your mask and let people see the one that God made with your strengths and your weaknesses and where you need people, but you have to develop a safe environment for that to happen. That's why he says, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. That word for hate, some of your translations say, abhor what is evil. Early, early part of my Christian life, and, and in some seasons, so I'm really honest, is you know, there's certain things where let's say this line is, you know, the word sin, one of the translations and meaning is trespass. In other words, God says, on this side you flourish, on that side you are 
trespassing my will, and here you'll receive pain, and you know, you're sowing to the flesh. I'll, in my early Christian life, I was always like, how close can I get to that line without crossing, right? I'm a young single guy, like how far can I go with a girl? Ooh, got really quiet. Or, or how about, you know, this movie's rated, uh, how, how much can I, how much violence, how much nudity, how much, how close can, I just wanna get as close as I can to sin, but I don't wanna fall in. This says, abhor what is evil and run towards what is good. The reason we pose is because we have those secrets is guess what, we keep putting ourselves in situations where we violate our conscience and we grieve the spirit. I, I did a word study on this word abhor or hate, and I could give you a lot of information, but let me give you a word picture that's helped me. Think, think about where you're tempted, okay? You personally. We're, we're, we're this kind of the areas that you're tempted with sin that you wanna get close to it, right? Because you really like this, but you don't wanna sin. Then imagine you've been on vacation for three weeks, and there was a carton of milk in there two weeks before you left, and somehow you forgot, and you go to the refrigerator, and you open it up, and you stick your head in, and that smell, could anybody done that? It, you know that smell, you just want to, oh my gosh, I'm gonna throw up? That's this word. Have that attitude toward sin. Have that attitude toward evil. Don't, don't say, well, they're a Christian and they're a Christian and they do this or they do that or they watch that and it's okay for them. It may be okay for them, but that's maybe why their life isn't working. What's God have for you? Abhor what is evil, cling. Run toward what is good because then you have the freedom to let the real you show up. And when the real you shows up, then something has to happen. You have to meet real needs. We're good at doing things that's convenient, right? Like sometimes, I don't know about you, but people call me and they want this or they want that. And, and sometimes people I know, they have lots of issues. And when they call me, it might be a really, really long time. So I'm in my car driving and my, you know, hands free, of course. Hey Siri, call so-and-so. And so they call so-and-so and I get a recording. And I say something silly like, oh, I'm so sorry I missed you. I got your call, hope everything's okay. And in my heart of hearts, it's like, oh, I'm so glad they weren't there. Because I didn't really want to talk to them. But, I'm, but, but now they think, they think I care because I answered and I left a message. <laughs> None of you have ever done that. Do you understand the very first sin recorded in the Bible is Acts chapter five? And Acts chapter five is the sin of hypocrisy. Ananias and Sapphira, they sell a piece of land. It was theirs, they didn't have to sell it. After it was sold, they didn't have to give it. But they said, this is how much we sold it for and it's all yours, apostles. And in fact, they gave some and kept some back, but pretended that they were very, very generous. And he walks in and Peter says, not why did you lie to me? Peter says, why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? I mean, this duplicity, can you imagine that cancer, what that would have done to the early church? I mean, I didn't grow up reading the Bible, so I'm reading through the New Testament like for the first time, and I realize this is hypocrisy, and Ananias drops dead. I'm thinking, man, this is like a serious book. I hope, hope that's not still in fashion or I'm in real trouble. And then his wife comes in and he, she's asked, so it, was that the price? And she says, yes, bam, she's dead. And it said, a great fear. The early church understood, you don't mess around with God. You don't pretend to be holy. You don't pretend to be loving. You don't pretend that you're this and you're really that. Because once hypocrisy and lack of authenticity happen, we really don't have anything to share. This is a strong passage. And then I love, it goes on, it says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. The word devotion. I mean, this is like if you've ever seen someone who's become a great athlete or a great artist or a great musician or I mean super focused in business. I mean devoted, they get up early, they go late. Whatever it takes, I mean they're passionate. This word says we're to have that kind of attitude where we have each other's back as much or even more than a blood relative. I'm devoted to you, whatever you need, whatever you're going through, you will never go through it alone. We're in this together. Isn't that a little different than it's good to have you in our small group. Thanks for bringing the chips. 
oh, did anyone bring a hot sauce? Well, that's really nice. And we're gonna watch this little video and then we're all gonna be polite and we're all gonna act a little bit more holy than we really are. And maybe a couple will have a good little conversation over there and we'll all tell each other what wonderful Christians we are. And we'll go home. Small groups are important, but they're just the container. Devoted to one another in brotherly love, giving preference to one another in honor. It's about devotion and humility. My wife taught me more about devotion than I ever knew. She came from a very broken, broken home tragedy. Then she went through yet another tragedy. And I met her as she was coming out of all of that. Those of you that have been through painful, painful family and rejection and difficulty or out of addictions, here's what I will tell you about broken people. When they come to know Jesus, they love deeply. They've, they've met Jesus in ways that some of us haven't. And out of that brokenness, there's a, there's a concern. There's, there's, a, there's a sense of God so cares and so loves, and we gotta pass that on. And so we're in seminary, and. We are very, very poor. I'm working full time and just trying to make it through, going to school full time. And we have these six year old boys, and there's a lady who has a six year old, and she just got a brand new baby. And she's super close friends. They're both Christians, and my boys play together. And the baby's about three months old, and the husband just leaves. Leaves her high, dry, no money, anything. And I come back from, from school and getting ready to go to work. And Teresa says, You know, our neighbor, they're going to kick her out of the, her apartment. We were all in. Bunch of students, government subsidized kind of housing, and uh, it was for poor people, and we qualified. Well, poor people and the people above us, and also for drug addicts. You know, it's a whole other story. But uh, Teresa said she's going to get evicted, and she's got a little baby. We should pay her rent. I still remember it's two hundred thirty-nine dollars. That that was a lot back then. I mean, we only made 900 a month. And I never knew for sure whether it was gonna come in depending on my job, if it was a commission type thing. I said, well, honey, I, I looked, and if we, if we pay her rent, we have $10 left, literally, in our checking, $10. And then our rent's due in another five, six days or so. Chip, I think we should do this. We're believers if we care, if we're devoted to, okay. You know, I'm like, Lord, you know. <laughs> I'm glad she loves you that much, but could you help me, you know? So, you know, I'm thinking, okay, I trust God. The, the context of Philippians 4.19, God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. The context is that you're walking with God and that you're giving generously and he'll meet your needs. So, our rent's due, no money. Three days of grace period. Day one, no money. Day two, no money. Day three, uh, I get an envelope in the mail that I don't recognize it has a picture of a helmet that is green and yellow and has a big G for the Green Bay Packers. And uh, I open it up, and I, he was taken uh, many years ago. Berkeley was the number one quarterback taken. I obviously sat behind a lot of really good quarterbacks in Green Bay. And, hey, Chip, this is Rich. You probably don't remember me. You came to my high school with your friend Glenn Miller when he was my coach and taught a Bible study. That Bible study was part of changing the whole course of my life. And I haven't thought of you for years, but the last week, you just keep coming up, coming up. I don't know why. I called Coach Miller. I asked where you were now, because I don't understand it. And blah, 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 blah. And then I opened the letter, and there's $1,000. I could tell you 10 stories like that. We start getting devoted to one another. God will take care of your needs. You, you, you start getting radical with your time, God will give you more time. Get radical with your money. Get radical with your talents. When we start living this way in this kind of community, I will tell you what, your neighbors and your friends and coworkers will say, where do you get love like that? And you say, Southeast. Southeast. Oh, you mean going to the big service? No, that's just, that's just you know, that's square one. No, 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 what we do is we have authentic community. We, we, get, we get down where you're in affinity groups with people and it takes time and you take risk and you gotta be careful. But we, the real you shows up and we meet real needs and we make real sacrifices. And then third, you have to do that for the right reason, not to please people. He says, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. That word 
Not lagging behind in diligence, literally it's don't be slow. In other words, you know what's right to do. Yeah, I ought to do that. I've got good intentions. No, he says, don't lag behind in diligence. Instead, fervent in spirit. It's a picture of water coming to a boil. In other words, it's passion. Like some of you are passionate, like Louisville played and UK played and other teams that probably don't matter like Ohio State, which I watched. Yeah, well, thank you over there. And, and you watch people there, they're passionate. Man, let's, he says, I want you to serve God, not please people, with the same level of excellence and passion that you bring to your biggest presentation, that you bring preparing your kids for school, that when you prepare a Bible study, when you're gonna serve someone, when you're gonna meet a need, it's not like, I think we got some old stuff here, or you know, I'll read that tonight before I go to bed, or I'll review it, they gave me some little thing before I teach those kids, no, 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 no not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit. Not for what people think, but serving the Lord. Jesus modeled his whole life considering others more important than himself. Authentic community doesn't happen because what happens is, what really authentic community is, is the love of God gets poured through the brokenness of individuals who are willing to be open enough to share what's really going on and then have enough faith to reach out and do things that they normally wouldn't do for one another. And, and whether that is paying a rent or, I have a friend in a Bible study who just for weeks he prayed for one of his closest friends, not even in the Bible study, because he needed a kidney or he was gonna die. One of his authentic community Bible study members after praying about this friend that he didn't know, gave his kidney to that person in the name of Christ. You, you talk about having your back. You talk about devotion. What do you think that family thought? What do you think happened to that group? What do you think happened to the buzz? No, hold on, wait a second. You don't know that guy. I don't know that guy. He's a brother. We belong to one another. I have two kidneys. He needs one to live. I can live with one. That's the kind of faith and a community that changes the world and it's happening all around the world. We are a spiritually poor people because we're so affluent, because we're American and because we're independent and we wanna do our own thing and we wanna be in control. Super poor people all around the world don't have any money, they're absolutely not in control, many of them are persecuted and they band together in ways and have all kind of joy without any kind of drugs or nice house, or nice car. But we have to realize we have a low spiritual position, so we have to take volitional, intentional steps to say, I'm really busy with what? Well, my business, my kids, the traveling team, making X amount of dollars, uh, you know, vacations already, right? What, what would happen if you just stopped and said, here's my calendar, Lord, here's my investments, here's my money, I'm not gonna be here very long. And I drive by people and I'm not sure anybody really knows me and the struggles I have and the issues in my heart. You know, Andy shared that and afterwards what we found was we had five, six, seven, eight groups start. I started telling that story or actually went on the broadcast to a million or so people. We started getting calls from all over the country about, hey, could we, and I said, hey, Andy, do you mind if I give people your number? No, not at all. There are thousands of men all across America in authentic community breaking the power of pornography because one guy had the guts and the courage to be authentic and deal with it and then be willing to say, hey, you know what? This is my issue. I'm not ashamed. There's no condemnation in Christ. You can think what you want. You're free. Let's act like it. And let's do it serving the Lord. One of the dangers of church life is um, you can start volunteering and you get strokes in church to be a nice person, right? Oh, thank you so much. Oh, thank you, we so appreciate that. Thank you for volunteering. Oh, you're so wonderful. Oh, thank you for that financial gift. And, and it's, it's subtle, but little by little, if you're not careful, you can start actually 
doing things, not, it's subtle, it happens, <laughs> and, and you're actually doing it to get the approval of people. Well, I've, I've been through the hardest seasons of my whole life, I've always been rooted, it's part of being from an alcoholic family, pleasing people. If you're here, you might jot down Luke 16, 15, Galatians 1, 10, and John 5, 44. I had to memorize those verses because a man came to me during a, a season when I was in some spiritual training and I, I was killing it. I was up early. I memorized more verses than anyone else. I was leading the charge. And he says, Chip, I'd like to meet with you. I said, oh, great. Thank you, Rudy. I thought, you know, I can't, you know he's probably going to be obvious to realize how you know, godly I am and how disciplined I am. And he said, uh, could you just read these verses and then maybe we can talk a little bit later? Oh, sure, you know, good, he's giving me extra homework. I'm, I'm a star, but I can be a superstar. Covering my insecurities with my arrogance. So I read Luke 16, 15. That which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. Galatians 1:10, Paul writes, if I were still trying to please people, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. John 5, 44, Jesus said to them, how can you believe when you seek not the glory of God, but you please people? See, authentic community starts cutting through. That guy loves me. He said, Chip, you have some gifts, but I'm not sure you wanna really please God. I think you're trying to find a place inside the body of Christ to get strokes because of your insecurity. And you'll never, you'll never have the joy and your life will never be what God wants it to be if your life is revolved around pleasing people. And I like to say I did those three verses. Guess what? I've never had a problem since. I have a problem to this day. Every time you know, I sit down there and I worship and, and my back hurts, so I stretch my leg and I pray. And one of the things I pray every time when I speak is, oh God, you know me. One, would you give me your love for these people? And then two, would you, would you give me sort of like, not give a rip about what anybody thinks but you? I mean, I, I like you people, but you know, I'm just human. I, you know, I want, you know, the smiles and the body language says you're doing a good job and afterwards, and you know what I thought is, oh God, would you just grant me the grace to not be so consumed with what people think? because that's a dead end street. And I can't trust you if my mind is on how people, and I won't be honest with them. I won't say certain things that I know. I, have I said some things that offended you? You don't have to raise your hand, but I, of course. Basically, I've spent time saying, your brand and your normal brand and focus of Christianity in America is dysfunctional, doesn't create disciples, if you're not in a group, you can't have authentic community. And if you are in a group, you don't necessarily have authentic community. And my prayer to God was down there and before and later is, you'll walk out of here saying, I can't keep living the way I'm living. You ought to, you ought to visit a 12-step meeting sometime. They put the church to shame in terms of honesty. I mean, it's unbelievable. I, I went to one and was like, oh my gosh, we're at something four, and this guy has seven pages of all the sins they've ever committed, and now they're making restitution. I mean, they're committed to change. And if they understand that the higher power, there's only one, is Jesus, then things really get rocking. Finally, you have to do it in the right way. And here, what I mean is, not in your own strength, but in the power of God. He says, upward focus, rejoicing in hope. That's a mindset. Not in circumstance, not in people, not in response, not in outcomes. God's gonna work all things for good. There is a place, I'm on my way there. Jesus prepared a place for me. And who can be against me if God is for me? And then in the midst of that, it's persevering in tribulation. That's an action. This is where I've wanted to give up. I've wanted to give up the faith. I've wanted to give up on my marriage. I've wanted to give up on the ministry. But I had people around me that love me enough that in my weakest moments, hey, you're not gonna do that. We won't let you. You can't persevere and make it through the hardest seasons. I went through cancer with my wife. Praise God, she made it through. But it was a time where, apart from the people around me, I don't think I would have made it. Do you have those people in your life? Do you? Because if you don't, those challenges are coming. 
And then notice the real resource devoted to prayer. This isn't like I'm praying in the car or I read a three minute devotional. I read, the, oh, this is the you version verse, great. Lord Jesus, will you bless my life? Thank you very much, I'll catch you later. Really? The king of the universe, the all knowing one, the all powerful one, and you tip him? You catch him here and catch him there? You prepare for meetings, you prepare for big things, for your kids, for this, for that. If you don't have time to pray from the heart, at depth, your, your behavior says, God, I just want you to know that I'm arrogant and I'm proud and I can handle my life without you. If, if one of my kids gets an ICU or my word falls, falls apart, I'll really pray a lot then, but I got this. We don't say it like that, right? But that's what our behavior says. God wants to help you. Ask, seek, knock. I love you, I'm for you. I wanna open doors, I wanna bless you. I wanna give you my joy. I wanna give you direction. I, wanna, I, I want to transform your life from the inside out. Invite me in. And then there's the outward focus, contributing to the needs of the saints and practicing or pursuing hospitality. Uh, this contributing to the needs of the saints, you know what it is? It literally means give money to other Christians that are in need. Not just corporately to the church and not for a tax deduction. I, uh, I, I just make the habit, I keep cash in my pocket. Anytime I travel and every day, and I know you got BMO and Vemo, you know what I'm talking about, <laughs> Zell. But I, I wanna, I wanna I wanna go into a restroom at an airport and see a guy that's 67 years old and is cleaning the trash and take something significant out of my pocket and say, tell me a little bit about your life. And I hear something. I said, do you know that Jesus really knows what you're doing here and he cares about you? Yeah. And then I put a pretty significant sum in his hand. He told me to give this to you. And it can be $5 here or $20 there. Just so, you know what? I just want to keep reminding myself Get off yourself, Chip. Every, God has people set up in our lives all over. Just a moment here, a moment there with the word of who it's from. Your heart will change. You become a generous person. And then he reminds us, it can't be just us four and no more. It says pursuing hospitality, literally, it means welcoming strangers. Who in your world is the unlovely? The person that doesn't fit. The person that's lonely and hurting. When you walk out in that atrium, a lot of us, hey, Bobby, Jim, good to see you guys. Hey, what are you doing? How's things going? Where are you guys going to lunch? If you'll pause just for one time, walk out of the atrium and you can talk with your friends and let your eyes do this. There's a lady sitting over there with a kid and she's a single mom. There's some guy with his head down. He looks like, ooh, boy. He might be dangerous, maybe he's just hurting. God brought him here and we can just pass on out because this is Southeast and it's a great church and the worship is great and the communicators are great. Just what would happen if we would welcome people into our world, opened our home, invited someone from work just to have a meal and don't even say anything about Jesus unless they ask, just love them. This meant so much to Jesus, he prayed, my prayer is not for them alone, the disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us. Why? So the world may believe that you've sent me. This is a hard message if you take it seriously, but it's a, it's a message of grace. The hurts, the pains, the struggles, the insecurities that every one of us have will never get addressed until the real you starts meeting real needs for the right reason and in the right way. And the Holy Spirit will bring the presence of the Father and the Son in those relationships in ways that are priceless and deep and transformative.